Hey there, this is Bram Kanstein and you're listening to Bitcoin for Millennials. Together with my guests on this podcast, I go on a journey to discover how our current financial system works, why it's flawed and why Bitcoin is the most relevant technology that you, my fellow millennials, should understand and adopt. But first, a little word from our sponsor, the Bitcoin Conference in Amsterdam. In a little over three weeks, on October 12 and 13, the most brilliant minds in Bitcoin from across Europe and beyond will come together for two days of learning, teaching and inspiring the Bitcoin community. It will be the first Bitcoin conference that I'm attending and I'm eager to learn, engage and party with other Bitcoiners. You can use my promo code BFM for 10% of your tickets. That's BFM to get 10% of your tickets. Now let's move on to this episode of Bitcoin for Millennials. I'm joined by Mark van Versendaal. Mark is an entrepreneur whose journey has taken him from psychology and high stakes poker to a dedicated focus on Bitcoin. Fueled by the 2020 pandemic, Mark took an extraordinary leap of faith. He sold everything and embarked on a nearly three year global journey with his family, questioning deeply ingrained beliefs about money, economics and social inequality. He came to understand the broken fiat financial system and how little control individuals actually have over their financial destiny. This put him on a mission to help individuals and businesses seamlessly integrate Bitcoin into their lives as he now does with his company. Don't miss this compelling conversation where we explore the philosophical and spiritual journey that led us both into Bitcoin and hopefully will help you too. Enjoy this episode and please let me know what you think. Right, it's working. Seems like it. Actually, you are around the corner, right? Like we are literally <laughs> 300 meters apart, but I, I don't guess, have a... <laughs> I guess so. I guess we could have done this live as well. Um, not entirely yeah. sure why we chose this way, but this is cool as well, right? I don't have a set. Do you have a set? No, no. Yeah, no, no. no. Not, no. What do you mean by set, by the way? Yeah, like, uh, like uh, to record locally. Well, maybe if there's another sponsor, then, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> later on, I, we I can have a have physical a lot of, recording. I do have a lot of equipment. So probably if we, if we look at what we all have, it would be a nice setting. I, I'm not sure if we have everything we need, but we, 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 we can find out probably next time. Okay, well, maybe later. We'll, we'll do it like this. Mark, welcome to Bitcoin for Millennials, right? Like you're the fourth guest. I'm happy. I'm happy that you're here. I think you have a really interesting story that is uh, fun and, and 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 nice to share with uh, with the audience that that we're building. But first, a quick check: which generation do you belong to? I guess I'm a millennial, right? I'm from 1985. So oh yeah, okay. Well, right? then we are both yeah. millennials. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Do you do you uh, do you actually identify as this generation, or like how mm. people identify with stuff nowadays? Well, no. Well, at first, definitely no. And now, um, because uh, the more you read, the more you study, the more the more you learn about all those different uh, generations, right? And you hear a lot of uh, shit talking about boomers. So, um, <laughs> uh, right, because they had it all and they had way more opportunity and yada, yada. And I don't particularly like that victim mindset. So to me, everyone is equal. I truly don't care which generation you are or aren't. What I guess is like, uh, be unique, be yourself and make shit happen, right? That's actually what I think. And that's basic answer to your question, I guess. Yeah, no, I love that. I think it's, it's interesting how people now identify with all these external things nowadays right like yeah. i i i think you read this book too like one of my favorite books is untethered soul by michael singer it's like the self-development book yeah well by the way eventually i think all these books <laughs> revolve around the same <laughs> concepts right but told in a different way but i like uh, he starts off with uh, you know if you ask someone a question like who are you you know and people start with like i'm my name that was given by my parents you know i'm my job or i'm a man or a woman or whatever you know like it that has become like way worse nowadays like people identify with a lot of all these external things instead of um yeah i think you know the self like who who they who they actually are right like wh what's your idea on that yeah no i'm 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 with you on that like it's all made up right it's all um so i studied psychology so then you pretty quickly learn how your mindset you know this this collection of limited beliefs uh emotions thoughts and all those patterns that um are all from the outside going in and if everything from the outside is going in and you actually identify with all of it, you suddenly have an identity that has nothing to do with the real true you. 
But if you go too far into this rabbit hole, like you will quickly find out that almost nothing is really you. Like it's mm -hmm. basically all made up. And uh, what I believe strongly is if you if can... the body is not you, right? Yeah, right? It's like, so if you can think about that out loud like we do now, you could make the argument that you can um, make it up for yourself the way you want it to. And then yes. it becomes a, a a a benefit. It becomes a a a, a form of power, right? And so I would say, um, if 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 everyone would be less willing to listen to all the things that they've been taught in school and by their parents and by their society, because they, those are all narratives, and just create your own narrative. And I think that if you do that, I. I strongly believe that Bitcoin, we, we probably going to talk about Bitcoin as well. I think so, yeah. <laughs> does that a lot, you know, and you can see that there are multiple narratives flying around and you can, of course, choose one of those narratives and then identify with it. And so the rest is all bad. Only that particular narrative of those particular hardcore Bitcoiners, that's the one I identify with. The rest is bad. Or you just create your own narrative and be part of the, um, uh, the global movement that Bit Bitcoin actually is in your own unique way. That's, that's yeah. how I think of it. Does it make sense? Yeah, yeah, no, I love that. And I, and I think in general, that's also what Bitcoin brings, right? Like when people talk about, is this a product or whatever? No, it's a, it's a protocol. It's a base layer set of rules that anyone can adopt and, and follow, but you can apply it in all these different ways, right? So no, I, fu I, fully, um, I fully agree with that. And I think it also really challenges people that because it's a protocol, right? With a set of rules that if you want to play, you have to follow the rules that eventually also leads to, you know, anything built on Bitcoin has the foundation of these rules that anyone can see, right? And and um, also with all the transactions and the ledger, et cetera. So it kind of like forces transparency all throughout, you know, the layers that are built upon this, this protocol. Um, I actually had like a Twitter conversation last week. And I think I also mentioned it in my episode with Peter Dunworth, like I love I, I love to say this, right? Like when people or institutions have to say that they are righteous or transparent or acting correctly or fair or whatever, like when they have to say it, they are not. Yes. Right? They, they have to say it because they can't show it. And what I love about Bitcoin is that A, the protocol and B, anything built on top, it has to follow the rules and the rules are there for anyone to see and you can agree to follow them or not. But like there's no there like it's yes or no right yeah. and so anyone doing anything with bitcoin they yeah they can try to talk shit but eventually they can be held accountable in in the most transparent way uh, possible so they cannot only say they are you know uh doing something fair but they actually have to show it like they have to like if you say you have to show it now and they say no then you already know that they're not um, acting in a correct way. Yeah. Right. And yeah, I absolutely love that about Bitcoin. And I think that also challenges a lot of narratives and, and yeah, thoughts, frameworks, you know, whatever, how, how things people use to, to operate their personal life or, or businesses in this. Uh, yeah. So yeah, if, if you, if you, if you study humans, if you study the brain of humans and um, it's, you will find out that we are indeed inherently corrupt, right? Like it's, we are also inherently good. So we, we actually have both of those sides in every human being. So if you then start to think about um, all the corruption that we have experienced already in the world, and you realize that it's all man-made corruption, then transparency is suddenly a very important feature to have. And yeah. this, this, this this transparency is the only way out, right? It's the only way that really keeps us honest. So yeah. in a way I experienced already, If it, and it doesn't matter if it's on LinkedIn, on Twitter, uh, in real life, every time when I meet people and they actually do not like Bitcoin or they do not love it, or and they have studied it, studied it or they do somehow know what it is, it's simply because they don't like that part of Bitcoin. They don't want to be exposed, right? They don't want to be seen. They want to have secrets. And I guess therefore everyone who likes Bitcoin um, after, a, after they've studied a little bit, 
I already know they have a the right foundation for me mm. to connect with them. And of course they can have thoughts about things that are differently than mine, but still I already yeah, know. That's not what it's about, right? Exactly, that's not what it's exactly. About. Do whatever it's, you want. But the fact that yeah. you love Bitcoin, once you've studied it for at least a few hours, I already know you're the right kind of man, right kind of woman, right kind of people for me. And that's an important feature of Bitcoin as well. It actually exposes the ones that still want to be lying and the ones that actually want to be truthful with themselves and with others. Yeah, no, I fully agree. I, I think it's a, it's really learning about Bitcoin and, well, I think deciding if you want to adopt it, um, spend more time or do something with it. Like it's also a really like spiritual journey in a sense that, um, and I wrote some questions down about this and I think we'll get to that. But like there's so many things you have to like, well, learn A, but also like unlearn, right? And challenge yourself and really understand like, okay, I I don't know everything and even when I discover something new that, that that I would rationally deem true, but if it goes like against all my beliefs that I've learned, that's just a really hard thing to integrate and, yeah. and adopt and then to actually live by, right? So no, I, 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 I fully agree with that. And I uh, also agree, like first time <laughs> we met, <laughs> this is the first time we talked, you know, but first time we met, I think we talked for an hour or something. You know, like that, that, it just goes yeah, naturally, like you understand what type of person you were talking to. And then again, like we can disagree on anything, but the, the underlying layer basically it, it, it is a certain, um, yeah, makes us have a certain connection that, uh, yeah, gives each other respect without, I think, just not knowing each other for that long. You know, but we can still jam like this, which I think Definitely. is something that we really miss nowadays, right? Like people, people see the world as uh, zeros and one or black and white or yes or no, like binary um, or not binary nowadays. But I mean, like so simple, like simplistic, simplistic, right? But it's, it's, it's very hard. It's, it's very hard to be alive, actually, right? Yeah. Like it's just, it's, it's hard. Like it's not, uh, it's not always uh, fun or nice. But that's just how it is, right? Like you can think something about it, but yeah, like you, you cannot really change it. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I honestly believe we, we miss that foundational layer that we then, in this case, Bitcoiners already have by knowing, okay, you're talking to a Bitcoiner. He probably thinks differently about specific stuff because yes, we are different, but the base layer, the foundational layer is quote unquote the same. And that feels really good. It's really easy to connect if the if the the foundation is already there and then you can have debates about almost any topic and it can go uh it can go head to head as well. You can be different, you can think differently, but the thing that you now see outside worries me of course because I cannot say the things that I want to say if I'm in a debate or in a conversation because people really don't want to hear specific things and I sort of thing that because that foundational layer is so corrupt or messed up, we are not able to say what we want anymore. And then you get people who stop talking. And if we stop talking, we stop learning. Yeah. If we stop learning, we go backwards. And that's yeah. what I feel is happening in society. So, uh, and I think a lot of Bitcoiners, uh, even maybe they see it because they, they, they think about it a lot or they, they are smart or whatever. And some don't see it because they don't think about it too often. But I guess subconsciously, everyone in Bitcoin's, Bitcoin feels it. And I think it's also a part why Bitcoin attracts so many different people. They feel this disconnection with the world. They don't know why. And it's also what you were mentioning, the disconnection with their own identity. Right? They have this made up story about themselves. They don't feel the connection with that narrative. And therefore they do drugs, they do alcohol, they work too much, they go work out too much or too little, they eat too much or too little. And all those things are just, I think something from the outside that's a consequence of not being connected to the true you and the real you. Yeah, I think I wanna ask you something like when you say, uh, and I, talk, I talked about this before in the, in the podcast, but also in other episodes, like, 
when we talk to people about Bitcoin, you know, like uh, um, I think British Hoddle said to me, like, oh, you're being you're being robbed, you know, like inflation is theft and um, all these things. And, and in my experience, when I talk with people about Bitcoin, I try to avoid these words, right? Or what you say, like the system is corrupted, right? Like, like I agree, but when you start off with these words or with these like statements, then that really puts people off and it's a really hard yeah, what follows is a really hard conversation then, right? Because uh, like I, I have a very good friend and we talk a lot about Bitcoin. He doesn't have any Bitcoin but, and I'm trying to, you know, like get get him there. But when I say like, oh, the money is corrupted uh, and, and you're being stolen from, then he just turns off. Like he, he just, he, he, he says like, oh, that's so, like, why do you use these words? You know, that's so harsh and this and that. And so, so what do you think about this? Like, I find it very hard to then, continue the conversation because I love him, you know, and I want him to see it. Um, but yeah, there's something that's holding him back, but perhaps there's also something that I could do differently. Like, like, what do you think about this? Yeah, no, of course I agree. Um, and it's, it's difficult in practice. So in theory, I fully agree because, um, I think if you know how the brain and how humans work, we can only change someone's mind by let him or her change it right so we cannot change it this means that the probably the best technique is to uh, to one know your shit and two do not like present that information but ask questions because yeah, questions I'm trying to turn that around now. yes <laughs> and that's it's difficult for me as well i mean i we love to podcast as well that's that means we love to talk we love to speak we love love to have interesting debates and if you only act, ask questions you are actually and that's the important part that i think guys like we and others have to change our mindset in we are actually more in control of the outcome of the conversation if we ask questions than instead if we present all the info because if we of course present all the info they have all those associations with all that information and they are going to create their own narratives and your friend in this example he is a good friend and he also is honest about what he feels and then says to you look um, I don't, I don't like it if you talk like this. So let's let's quit altogether. So that's being honest. But 99% of people, they just stop listening to you, act like they are listening, and then opt out anyways. Right? You don't mm -hmm. change minds in this way. So yes, I agree. However, in practice, like I said um, when I was starting this little um, uh, little little preach, um, I I think in in practice it's really difficult it, because you have been in all those corners of of this rabbit hole already, and all the things that they want to say you already know. So before they say it, you already want to like cut it cut okay. it out, <laughs> and yeah. therefore they don't have a chance in the conversation. So it's not actually a conversation, and they don't actually believe that you're listening to what they are feeling and to what they are sensing. So everyone with that's the advice I give myself on record right now. So hopefully nobody listens <laughs> in my direct environment, but start from zero every time, every time yeah. start from zero and just ask questions, then you will probably get there because they do know, they do know because they, especially the people who already, I, I hate to say woken up, but you, you understand what I mean? They already sense or feel, Hmm, this is not how my life should be. They, they, they are uh, dissatisfied about things. That's why they eat too much. That's why they drink too much. That's why they use too much drugs. That's why they do work that they don't like. They have created this narrative that all these things are quote unquote normal, but they aren't and they know it. And I mm -hmm. guess if you and I come with the, with the Bitcoin questions, the philosophical Bitcoin questions, they do want to be honest and they do want to be uh, vulnerable. But not if you and I present how life should be, right? Um, so, so no, one hundred percent. Yeah, not, yeah, no. yeah. So I, 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 I stopped that a long, a long time ago. So I do try to ask questions, but it's more about. Um, yeah, I think my point was more about like it's just the words. Like sometimes people just turn off because they hear certain words. But I think you know that also ties back to I yeah you know, I want to say like this personal journey, right? Like o opening your mind in a certain sense. Well, when you actually are aware of what you mentioned, you know, that, okay, um, my life is like this, but I don't think it should be like, what, what are the influences here, like outside of me and, and, and what are the things that I can control, you know, and then from there, 
perhaps a seed is planted to open your mind. And like I, I always told myself, like how I view myself, like how I learned about this is just like you have to open doors in mm -hmm. your mind that you even that you, that you didn't even know were there, right? And then when new information comes in, yeah, you have to battle with like the narratives that you you thought you understood or knew or believed or whatever. And then, yeah, it's just a slow, it's a, it's a slow process. No, but this ties Maybe, back to yeah. the words, th this ties back to the words you were mentioning, like those uh, more aggressive words about stealing and, and corruption mm -hmm. and propaganda and whatever. One more thing about that. Yes. So that closes the doors in their minds. So they have associations with those words and then they yeah. instantly stop listening. So therefore I would say the only way is to turn it around and you can only know which you, words they use if you let them talk, right? Yeah, so therefore exactly. the question yeah. part, yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right, so you just came back from a three year global journey with your family <laughs> and are now fully focused on Bitcoin. What, I, I love that you did this, but yeah. what I noticed is there's similar stories to yours. There's also a fellow Dutchman who did the same. Um, uh, what's his name? Didi Taihutu. Uh, you know, he went also all in on Bitcoin. But there's a lot of these uh, stories, right? Like, what what do you think fuels this? Wow, yeah, that's a good question. And and um, like, uh, of course, I can speak for myself, and I can speak for the ones that I came across while traveling, right? Look, we have two little daughters, right? One uh, at the time was barely one year old and the other was was barely four years old. So now they are four and seven, right? So um, uh, lots of people don't believe that this is possible with really young kids, but of course it is possible. And I guess the, the, the things that we were talking about already in this convo, so the things about uh, asking yourself the question, is this actually my life? Is this actually me? Or is this all made up? And if so, by whom? If you ask those questions, I think you end up with Bitcoin more <laughs> often than not. If you go deep enough, like, of course, you can go. In, yeah. So the well, spiritual thing is downstream from money, right? Like, I think that's one of yes. the things that I see as one of the like, pillars of why Bitcoin. And I have to say, like, I don't always understand it fully as to why that is. So I assume something still, and I, I still don't understand it fully. But what I hear a lot is every everything, all the problems we have is downstream from the money. And how I um, kind of like shape that is, okay, we have no clue how much money there is. Money is made by the by the press of a button. Nothing is backing the money, actually. Um, I was in a Twitter conversation with a guy who said, yeah, money is backed by the debt that someone owes and, and that they're going to repay it or something. Like, that That didn't make any sense to me. So I, I just think the, the money is not backed by anything. <laughs> uh, and work is backed by energy. You put in energy. So that is already, like, not uh, a, a great equation. Uh, Compare that to Bitcoin. It is backed by energy. It's fully transparent. The rules are transparent. We know how many things are like, like it's just intransparent versus ultra transparent. Right. And again, if you think that the, if the base layer is transparent, anything downstream from a transparent base layer is conceptually honest and fair and all these things and anything downstream from something that is super intran intransparent. Yeah. Uh, of course, uh, if it can be corrupted, you know, if there's a door open for it to be corrupted, then people will corrupt it because we are, it's fight flight, you know, we are in survival mode. So, and you see that with your young children as well. I see that too. Like, uh, it's me first and then the rest, of course. So if you have a chance to misuse an intransparent system then obviously that happens right you know yep. whether you and i would think we would not do it if we are close enough we would probably do it right um so that is my understanding of everything all the problems are downstream from the broken money, money. basically yeah sorry to interrupt but that is like i want to share um you know how 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 i kind of paint that paint that picture yeah, yeah. And I, I, I guess you're right. The, um, everything is all downstream from money. If you, let's say, it all starts with awareness anyway. Because, of course, if you think about uh, why, why is it, why are people traveling the world and why are they also Bitcoiners? Um, if you are aware 
about who you want to be in life and where you are at that point in time, you start to ask yourself questions. So awareness, you raise awareness. You're going to look for answers. And if you're going to look for answers, you are probably ending up of you being part of the economic machine. And that's why you're fed up with life. You know, we had, we had two young kids. My wife was basically crying in the car for hating her work. I was not hating my work, but it was a lot. It was a lot and I was making a lot of money as well, but I was not the dad that I wanted to be for my daughters. And I had an, a vision in my life, how, uh, how I wanted my life to be, and it was not the same anymore. So you start to become aware. And if you start to become aware, you start actually start asking questions. How did I end it up here? And then you're gonna start thinking about your parents, right? And about your direct environment and also about school and about work. And then you start to like, slowly, gradually, then suddenly figuring out, okay, I'm, I'm just a product here. I'm the product. I'm not being me and unique at all. I'm just a product like anybody else. And that makes you probably, um, it, that brings you to a mindset that you start questioning that a and B, how can I go? How can I escape this? How can I quote, Do you think this is a, like a Western world problem? I think the Western world problem is it's definitely bigger in the West. Definitely. Like we all li live in concrete walls, like um, pretty much very, very close to each other. So a lot of, a lot of triggers every day, every second of the day around you. Um, and of course, um, if you need people to be part of the economic machine, you need the man and the woman to keep it going. And then of course, family, becomes a thing of the background. Whereas in South America, where I've traveled in Asia, where I've traveled in Africa, where we traveled, family is a way more important cornerstone of society still. There, the moms do not work a lot, right? So it's, it's, it's different than here. So yes, I would say the problems are bigger here, but it all makes sense if you think out loud about it. If you start to figure out the incentives, um, the taxation, the whole system in general, you start to understand where all the narratives come from and why people do what they do. They need to do this in order to get the incentive and to stay alive in the economic machine that we are living in. So yeah, I do believe that once you, like I said, it all starts with awareness. Once you raise it, you start to ask more questions and you will end up with all the narratives created by, um, uh, by the world as it is. And so, if that's all incentivized by money and the monetary system, of course you end up at Bitcoin. So I, it makes sense that travelers, world travelers, um, are also interested in Bitcoin as well. Yeah. And so how did you first become interested in like investing, finance? Yeah, et cetera? Like, uh, uh, of course. Um, so I, I studied psychology. Um, I, I, learned about the principles of scarcity. And therefore I always thought, okay, the best investment you can make is in yourself. You know, like there are 8 billion people, the only truly unique thing, and that's really scarce, that's me. So I was already pretty, um, pretty much involved with investing a lot in myself. So it didn't take a lot of time before I ended up investing in general. And so then um, me being me, me being a human as well, I ended up in the shit coins as well. I thought it was easy to make money with it. I loved the psychology part of the, um, of, of the cycle. So I thought it was an interesting digital technology revolution kind of energy. So I ended up over there and um, that was the same period. I guess it was the same period that I really ended up ended with the with the shit coinery and became more interested in Bitcoin once COVID um, came into the world. The, pandem the pandemic start. That was the point in time that, of course, a lot of narratives that we are talking about got destroyed. And I think people were um, aware already. I was pretty aware already. That was the final push that I needed to like raise my awareness ask questions about what I was doing about, Hey, we can do this differently with a family. And also if you do this with a family and you start traveling the world with a lot of money, with a lot of capital, you also should be doing the right things with the capital while you're traveling. 
And so only invest in things you truly understand. That was an important rule that I learned. So I stopped with all the things that I did not understand. And the only thing that I wanted to learn is how the monetary system worked. So that therefore I knew if I had to invest it in, um, in government bonds, in specific stocks or in Bitcoin or in crypto. And of course I learned the economic situation was changing and to me, it became actually clear that I needed to learn more about money per se. And therefore I ended up at Bitcoin. Nice. So yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. I love, I love, uh, our story is very similar, I think. And that's in that sense, I, uh, I mentioned in another episode, like I was, uh, when I was 30, I had a mortgage in a house and I was working at a bank and I talked to a colleague at one point. And he told me, like, do you know that the money in the bank is not yours? And I said, what do you mean? <laughs> so then uh, we had a lunch for an hour and he told me how it worked. And then I thought, wow, this makes absolutely, well, it makes sense in a certain, conceptually, you know, how, how it works, the fractional reserve banking, like it, it, it makes some sense. But it takes so much like sovereignty uh, away from the depositors, the people who put the money in the bank that I thought, okay, this is just like, I'm doing this, but I don't understand it basically. And that's also when, and I think that ties back to what we talked about, like this, this self-development path. I was just thinking like, okay, I'm an idiot as well, right? <laughs> like I'm participating in something that I have no understanding of. So I think I should actually try to understand it before I participate uh, or keep participating or maybe participate more in it, right? Like whatever, whatever my conclusion uh, would be. So that's also kind of like one of the, the starting points for me where I was like, okay, I have absolutely no clue, but I think I should know, right? Although it's very confronting, I think I should, you know, in, in investigate this more. So what, what, what is your conclusion and like, how, how do or what is your explanation? I'd rather say, like, how do governments control and influence the money? Like, how does that work? What's your understanding of that? Yeah, well, um, of course, like we, we have a um, few central authorities, institutions that are able to create money. And like you said, like we have the fractional reserve banking. So we have commercial banks that are able, indeed, when you deposit like thousand dollars uh, or thousand euros, they're able to like at least 90% of it to lend it out again. And when you lend it out, uh, when they lend it out to someone else and they buy a home with it, by the way, then of course you need higher numbers, but let's say you lend it out like 400,000 euros to someone. This person of course is going to buy a house with it. And that means that another person um, receives that 400,000 euros at their bank account. And therefore that bank can lend it out again, well, 90% of that amount. So you get a creation of money upon a creation of money upon a creation of money. And so a lot more money is going into the economy. Of course, I understand that if this money is used correctly and creates more productivity, that you do have an argument to say it has also something good in it, right? So I, I understand that that, that Keynesian um, argument, I understand it, why you probably quote unquote need inflation to grow. But in the end, if you talk this through, it does not make sense because money actually was a bottom up process, right? And a bottom up process means that we wanted money to create prosperity. We, the, the, the people, we needed it to grow in various ways. And if it's a bottom up process, you have to rethink about it and you have to think, okay, what then make, makes a good form of money? A good form of money makes a, um, the end user be the one that wins because I wanted money in order to be, to make it easier to trade, in order to make it easier to buy and, and in order to make, to, in order to save. And if you then figure out, um, well, as an end user, it's probably best if the money that I use, that I, that I can choose the money that I want to use, that's one, and, and B or two, that it at least is something where I can store, store value in through time and through space so that I can spend it whenever and wherever I want. That's basically yeah, because what I if want. I, if I sell something to you and you give me money and I don't necessarily need or want to buy something else right now, then I should be able to save what that money is worth that 
yeah the value of that money over time right but now it, it dilutes now over time it becomes worth less so that does not mean the number changes but it buys less right yeah. and so yeah. that's how um and i don't know <clears throat> a lot about like keynesian and austrian philosophy but the keynesians say uh, that's how the economy keeps going because people are incentivized to spend it right and eventually that turns into that, that that's their argument for continued growth i.e prosperity um and their biggest uh, argument against what you say right like okay no i should be able to save it over time um in the best asset in the world which is uh, what we think bitcoin right then they say yeah okay but if you save it like why why would you spend it right then like the economy grinds to a halt but i think then there's there's great arguments against that as well right like uh, uh if, if my headphones are are broken and i need new ones am i gonna wait until uh there's another price on them like next week or the week after or what no i need something now right or what like when you need food you're not going to wait until the bread is cheaper next week you know so i no. think and, and what i like and, and this is really my thinking but if someone comes with like such a complex argumentation and this whole fucking story right and then if you can if your rebuttal can be so simple then in my mind like the original <laughs> argument is just so flawed done already <laughs> right? like yeah. if you have to talk so much to make your point like then yeah you're trying to um yeah then i think your original point is just not that strong right like if no. you have to use all these filler <laughs> now it's, words it's, like, basically like it's 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 even stupid because there are so many things that people need and want right now that they don't care they they couldn't even care if they want to care um, to to buy it right now because there are things we especially need and want in order to stay alive and there are also things that people just want to do in their lives like if you know how psychology works then you also quickly find out that that Keynesian thing is only um, created that narrative is created because already everything is based on debt and if you if it's based on debt then then you indeed need people to keep spending faster than normally in order to pay for stuff yes. that they don't actually want and need and now you come to the you get to the the foundational stuff that we are philosophical stuff that we were talking about earlier already why are people so disconnected why are they so unhappy because of course if the like everything around them constantly keeps incentivizing not only to spend money but to feel them less whole if they don't have it because that's what what marketing does that's what advertising does that's what propaganda does is you actually feel less whole if you're constantly surrounded with people or images or movies or advertisement who have more than that you have so now you suddenly start to think you want something and therefore you buy it with money that indeed becomes worth less. So you already have the incentive underneath the money, but you have also the incentive in the economic machine to keep spending for stuff you actually don't want. Now you bought it, you bought that bigger house, you bought that more beautiful car and all the other stuff and shit you don't need. Now, of course, this is how psychology works. Now you are afraid that you might lose it one day. So now you get anxiety. Now you worry about losing your job because you might lose that big house or that beautiful car or all that stuff that you think actually makes you happy. Those expensive dinners. No, you don't like the cheap ones anymore because you were able to afford the expensive ones. So you create a narrative that those expensive dinners are the things that are make you happy. Now, of course, now you start to do more and more work to keep spending for those things, but you don't like your work. You don't like your life as well. You can really figure out a way, like if you keep going deeper into this narrative, you start to believe, damn, this goes so much deeper and it's so much um, explanation or at least parts of the explanations why people are working so damn hard for things they actually do not like. And, and if you then start, if you come back to the money part. To impress and, people that don't think about them. Exactly, right? exactly, exactly. Yeah. Like, uh, what do I give what someone else has or does not have? 
you, if, if you actually care about something like that, if you actually feel you are a bigger person, if you drive for your, in, in your Audi or your BMW or whatever, and you think less of the people next to you that, that drive a Toyota or whatever, then there's something inherently wrong in your own self-esteem already. And that, of course, is, is, is able, you can able to tie this back to, to the money part. So if you go like in short, and that's the last thing I say about this, if you think about Austrian economics and you make money, you create real world value and you get money in return that's able to store wealth through time and space, you are calm. And now because you work for it, you actually work for it, you're going to think twice before you spend it on something stupid. So you will probably spend it on something interesting, something that's going to become worth more. So this is the argument. I believe that when we have a good form of money, people will definitely invest, but they think better and they invest in better stuff to create a better world. And, and people will think about what is the value of the thing I'm creating, right? So the things that are being bought, the services, the products, there's going to be way more natural competition in upholding like a higher quality yes. of, of these services and products because the money is fair, right? Yes. Because we are not incentivized. To, you know, if, if you can make cheap money, cheap money in, in the money that we have now, because you can spend it fast, like why would you invest a lot and have a high quality standard for the product or service that, um, that you're offering? Right. So I think this is also what, uh, safe Dean says about like, uh, short, uh, short time preference and long time preference, right? Like the short time preference is okay. Uh, I got the money now, now I got to spend it on this st stupid thing, you know, as you mentioned and, and long time preference is all right. I did my best. I got this money. I know I can, you know, this energy, I, I know I can save it over time. I'm going to improve myself even better because I, I g actually get rewarded for my input. Like what I put in is rewarded with something that, um, yeah, is, is a fair reward. I almost want to say, right. And now people are more incentivized because the money is, is yeah, I just say cheap. I don't know if that's the right word, but they are incentivized to just do quick wins and whatever. Like I see these. YouTube ad rolls like of these these people who say like oh I made thirty thousand dollars with this PDF that I made with ChatGPT and you can do it too you know like shit like that like there's no value in that I, I mean uh, well I, I don't know if you now live in a new house I, I live in an in an older house like I have woodwork here that you don't see anymore right like someone made a door and thought hmm I'm I'm gonna make this even nicer you know like with like these nice yeah um, yeah just just I don't know even how to say what the English word is, but like nice decoration, yeah. you know, like they spent yeah. more time on it. It's not like a, a two two by four type of, uh, <laughs> you know, yeah. door frame painted white, whatever. And I, 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 that's kind of my thought around this, right? Like if, if you can, if you can have a long time preference, you can also actually do what you like and become really good at that and find value in just doing that thing, being grateful that other people you know, appreciate what you make. Like for me, that like spiritually, that would help also a lot of people. Definitely, right? I think definitely. we would be happier. Def one hundred percent. And and to if if we all are able to lower our time preference and think about long term more, um, it it will become easier, and you will become more at ease as well with who you are, and you have more time to figure out what you are, who you are, and what you want. And with regard to and the what central... you can add in the world, also exactly right? like what is your what yeah is, and, yeah what's and, your added value here? Yeah, and you understand yeah. that added value doesn't come from nowhere. You actually have to work, sweat equity, right? And so you will not quit within a year because you realize something good will only come in one, two, three, four, perhaps even longer. So you need to keep doing it, keep studying, keep improving, keep networking, etc. And with regard to the centralization uh, and the banking system and the centralization of power, like you, you were already talking about like an interesting argument that you can say one thing and you already have dismissed actually a whole theory, right? It's also like the one that also impresses me is, is like, how is it fair that I have to work for money 
that someone else can just print or create out of thin air. Like in what world is that fair? Yes. And and if you well, if you wait keep, wait yeah yeah so just uh, even without the fair part like right like why do people work for money that others can just print just that statement yeah. right yeah yeah why is it not made clear to us why that is why yes. don't we the people who do the work why don't we understand it right and just that I think is nice also for the people listening like think about like if that triggers you if you think like well i don't really care then okay you know that's fine yeah, like fine. there's no really better better or good in that sense but if if there's even a remote remotely somewhere a trigger like hmm yeah that that does indeed sound a bit strange you know like that that should be the thread that you should like pull on right yeah what, what you will find is not that fun no. right but 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 i 100 percent agree like just that argument it sounds so illogical that even even if it would be a good thing explain it to the people educate the yes people, right like why do why do we do this why does it work like this and i think well you and i uh, went to school in the same time right and and i think currently like nothing has changed but we never learned about this nope. never you never you never learn about this and why don't you learn about this about it because some people profit from it and others do not right and that's not even in a malicious way it's just a natural way what we talked about before yeah. like if if something can if a system a man-made system by the way i think it's always funny sorry this is a sidetrack but when i see lagarde of uh you know the eu or uh or, or, or what's her, what's her name sorry the uh, ecb when she says yeah inflation came from nowhere and we are trying to tame this monster like these words for me are so ridiculous because I think this is a man-made system. This is not a natural system. This is a man-made system, right? So if something is a man-made system, how can you say, oh, I'm so overwhelmed by the consequences of this man-made system. You know, we are trying to battle the inflation beast. Like it's just, it's, it's so unfair to even say that, right? Like it's so not taking your responsibility, you know, she didn't come up with this system. That's fine. You know, but yeah. you you are still uh, in ch uh, partially in charge, at least of your part in the system. You know, so yeah, I, I find that so interesting. Just listening to those words, where where people like put that um, responsibility outside of themselves or yeah. outside of a system, or yeah, you know, because if you ask one question about you know how it ties in with the system, then their entire argumentation does kind of falls apart. Right. Yeah, and I think everyone that listens uh, is listening right now. Um, like one thing is it should be aware as well that we, probably you who are listening as well, we are part of that system as well. And we are also privileged, right? That's important yes. to realize. Like I agree. Because that's what a printer does. Like, like you said in the beginning, the closer you are to this money printer, the more access you have to cheap money and to capital. But to, yeah. with cheap money, I don't mean quote unquote bad money. I mean, we have a cheap way to find the strongest money that there is, the dollars and the euros. And I've yes. traveled the world, right? So I've seen all those broken currencies everywhere. And those people do not have access to the dollar easily, to a cheap dollar or to a cheap euro. So they have less um, availability, less access to all this, this capital. And that's what the system also does. It has um, the energy that incentivizes centralization of power more and more and more. And that's simply because they can create money for the ones that they like, and they don't create money for the ones they don't like. Therefore, you see a, 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 a constantly growing um, wealth inequality, not only within borders, but also within nations. And therefore, you... It's, it's difficult for other countries or also for people who are not like close to the money printer to be themselves, to become that person they really want to be, to also live up to their dreams. It, it definitely is a lot more difficult for 99% of the world than to us. And of course, you can think, okay, well, that's my luck, of course, but you can also think about, okay, why is this not transparent? And that's why we keep ending up at the transparency part you were just mentioning. Why, if it's if it's a good thing, fine. If you think we have to be ruled by this financial system, that's okay. But if I'm then in the university or at school, teach me why. 
then teach mm -hmm. me why and be honest about it because then you can make the argument that it's actually a better system for example than bitcoin but now they just how do you say it? rip it under the uh, rub it rub it under the carpets and they don't talk about it <laughs> yeah 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 i don't know if that's a translation no. <laughs> no, they just ignore it basically yeah right like yeah. it's just yeah. not it's just not there no, no. i agree no. but it's also it's also not there i think because yeah most people don't have or take the time to actually tr try to understand it and research and what we talked about you know like challenge challenge themselves so yeah i think it's just hard but i think it's a really good point what you say about privilege like even we are closer to the money printer than someone in south africa or uh, lebanon or whatever right so we 100 percent have more benefits from um yeah being close uh, and in a very rich country uh, and being close well. to to the to the euro in this case right so i think that's a fair point i also kind of see it um and that's <laughs> what i experience also when i talk with people about bitcoin when i tell them like okay yeah I, I really think you should study this, you know, or buy Bitcoin or whatever. Like I've sent these text messages to my friends in caps yes. at five, five K, you know, you buy one fucking Bitcoin right now, please. I love you, please. You know, um, and it's not, it's not even because I have Bitcoin and then the price goes up. Like, I feel it's a really altruistic thing. Like I, I love these people and I want to show them and tell them and help them. Right. So I also think back to your privilege part like the other side of that like doing this podcast or or what do you do with your company like it's just i i, I think we think we are good already so we are now trying to help and educate others you know like we yeah. already see it but but we want others to see it as well and yeah I, I i can honestly say that for me that that is not about the number go up thing that's more about uh you know get out of the other thing uh <laughs> that, yeah. that is what motivates me right yeah. so yeah I, I i think that is also a nice realization um but also i think a good thing also to say and share you know that yeah i sometimes talk to people and they say well you only tell me because you want the number go up and then i think yeah that's just your that that's projection that's you yeah that's your projection right like that's you that's you talking like i know it's not fun what i'm sharing you like duh <laughs> like yeah. i went I, I went through this as well um but yeah i i really think i'm coming from uh yeah like an altruistic m motivation here um also because i realized that i can actually do it yeah. we can we well it's uh it's 11 uh, a.m on a tuesday and we are recording this podcast you know so th th that is hopefully our contribution because yeah. we were already lucky you know? Yeah, I do realize I'm privileged and I do realize I have the ability to help others either with a podcast or with a company or with just simply helping people, sharing information and insights. I fully agree. It's altruistic um, with me also. Of course, they believe you want to pump your bags, but I do not believe that if I orange pill like 100 people or 200 or 500 that I actually pump my bags. Right? There's um, nothing yeah. happening if I will do that. So that's not my motivation. The motivation is like, I, I, I honestly feel that, um, I, this, this, I, I want a more honest system, even if that means that the Netherlands where we live will be less rich. If, if it means that actually, and if it's going to be more honest, which means everyone that actually produces real world value, that person wins. That's what I think is capitalism. The one that I produces yes. real world value to another, that person um, is allowed to win. And I want people to win as well. And if they are winning, save that value in something that stores it in a right manner. So yeah, um, we, we, we need to figure out a way uh, to make sure that people don't feel that, that anger or anxiety and they don't project their own fears and their own selfish, selfishness uh, on, on to us when we are sharing that information, but um, it it will be a long journey because I I'm thinking about this out loud. If someone tells to me like your mom is corrupt, and I know my mom for a very long time, I don't yes. like it, right? I don't like it, and I of don't course. believe it. I don't believe it because I know my mom better than this person. I would say, and even if they show me pictures, I say those pictures safe. Uh, sorry, um, are fake. 
Um, the same is true, I guess, a little bit for money. If you if you were able to trust your government for 20, 30, 40, 50 years plus, always they did the right thing. And the money was quote unquote good enough because it was all on the background. All that inflation was on the background. Um, you weren't all at schools. Nobody shared information about it. And then suddenly when you're 50 years old, you hear that the money you have been using and are using is corrupt or sorry, that word mm, is not that good. Then of course you say, no, what are you talking inferior, about? Inferior, let's say inferior. Yes. <laughs> and you, oh, you are a Bitcoin maxi or you're only about pumping your bags. I, I understand that response um, very well. So um, it, it will take some time. And I think we, as long as we keep pushing the right questions and on the right buttons, we will be able to show them the difference between this transparent system and this not transparent system. Yeah. And I, I think we kind of touched upon this already, but I also wanted to ask like, what, the, what does Bitcoin say about the concept of trust in our society? Like, I think, I think we talked about this in a sense that, well, this projection or what you just mentioned, right? Like just the response of people, but also, yeah. And I'm thinking why I just mentioned this whole thing about being altruistic just now. Like I, I almost find it sad that I have to explain that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, maybe you shouldn't. Maybe you shouldn't. Maybe you just like um, like next time when somebody someone believes it. Like um, I just let it slide because um, I I come to this point. I truly don't care. I truly don't care anymore what people think of me. So of course there are still moments that I'm a little bit more weak or that I'm weaker and or that someone makes an impression on me and I want to be make him or her impressed as well about me that I, I, I think about it a little bit more, but in general, I, 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 I begin to lose that feeling that I want to impress other people. So if they actually believe that I'm not doing this, um, from the right spot, okay, you know, leave it. I don't have time anymore for those people. And I don't want to convince people. I just want to help people that want to be helped. So maybe next time, and it, I, I say to myself as well, that's why I'm thinking out loud. Next time when people gives me that feeling that I'm doing it for myself or for, to make money or for whatever, okay, fine, leave it. You're not for me, I'm not for you, next. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, you shouldn't be able to tell that you come from a good place if you know for yourself, I come from a good place. Yeah, that you are, exactly, yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 I agree. So what? What was a belief that made you not get into Bitcoin when you first encountered it? Like what was holding you back? Well, the first time when someone was sharing it with me, that was 2016. Um, and I guess Ethereum came around in 2017 and people were making money with it, like in a very fast manner. And I was always raised that that's impossible, right? That's impossible. So what goes up quickly must come down quickly as well. It probably is a scam. So that was the reason why I just ignored it uh, for a very, very long time until I met a spiritual, uh, a spiritual teacher and he made me aware of it. Um, however, he made me also aware of crypto as a, as a beautiful part of the growing society. So, um, I had to unlearn that as well, but the beginning phase was just me thinking, well, this can be real. It's internet money. This can be real. Um, and I also wasn't aware of the, the global financial system yet enough to understand inflation enough. So I did not believe that something with a maximum supply would be a better solution for something that's not even a problem because that was what I believed in 2017 there. We don't need a solution because it's not a problem because I was not that good informed about what happened in 2008 and 2009 yet. Do you also think that's the main thing that people need to unlearn before they can understand Bitcoin? I would say that, and that's why I post relentlessly, relentlessly about the financial system in general, not about Bitcoin, about inflation and about how this is a problem already and could become a way bigger problem for almost all countries on earth. So yes, I really believe that if you truly understand what inflation is and a little bit how the system works that you do believe there there need to be a solution to this just to solve the fact that people cannot save their wealth just to solve the fact that people do not need 
to spend their money right away in order to prevent it from losing value only a year after. Yes, I do believe because um, then you can start by dribbling down to society and why we are all buying things and working for things we actually do not need, like or love. Yeah, yeah, I do. I do think that. Yeah, you. Yeah, that's a good question. Huh? Um, I, I uh, first thought I have is like you need to actually accept that you don't know everything and that that what you think you know is just taught to you. I think it's also easier actually to realize this when you have children um because well at least for me like i <clears throat> i once had this thing he was playing here on the on the carpet and he did something and i i don't know i kind of snapped or i said something and he he totally ignored me but then i thought damn this sounds like my mother <laughs> <laughs> and so i realized that yeah. uh you know it's, i think it's just a funny example but more like yeah, how you are is also how, yeah, you were taught to be from anything that you consumed, whether it's from your parents or your friends or stuff you watched or like when we were younger, we were on the internet all the time, you know, like it's, you, you, you shape yourself unconsciously in a certain way. And I'm also thinking, of course, this, this podcast is called Bitcoin for Millennials. You know, they are a bit older. I, I'm also thinking like, and I, I cannot speak for people who are like 25, 6, 7, but I, I think it's just harder to have this kind of like internal conversation or challenge, you know, like how am I programmed? You know, again, not in a bad way. I think when, when, when I say that, sometimes people could think like, oh, that you know, you're programmed or you're yeah. indoctrinated. But yeah, it, yeah, well, you are. It is the words. Are, yeah, yeah, you know, it is like, like, it is. Yeah. yeah, those are the words. Like, I yeah. cannot change it. Like, I, I really think, uh, and, and, and I've experienced that, you know, children are so pure. They are so open and honest and really connected to, to their self, right? And yeah, we mess them up. <laughs> yeah. We do our best, but we do mess them up. And they're going to mess themselves up because they're going to make narratives in their own head, just like we did, just like everyone does. Right. And at one point, and personally, I'm definitely not there uh, fully, but I'm working on it, you know, like, okay, what, what do I actually want to adopt? What do I want to keep? What do I want to discharge? You know, like, what do I want to throw away from, from my system and my, my, uh, like the term software in that sense, like how you are programmed, you know, and I, I think to start is understanding that you don't know everything that you are actually programmed and also, yeah, maybe have even one thing of which you are like, yeah, I just don't want, I don't want to be like that anymore. Like, that's just something that I, yeah. Why, why, why is that part of, of, of me? Like, I don't want that anymore. And that's, I think where you start to kind of learn that process, like understanding that you are a certain way, accepting that you cannot change it like what what that is but but also understanding that you can exchange it basically for 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 something else and once you go through that with with two or three things then i think it becomes easier to be open for yeah other information that is challenging you know however you 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 think you are or feel or you know however you want to define that so i think I think that's the start. It's not necessarily about a certain type of subject you need to unlearn, but it's more about, yeah, really it starts with yourself. So. Yeah, well, to add to yeah. that, like, I think we should be aware, all, all, all of us should be aware. So this is for us as well. Uh, people in general don't like change, right? And there's a reason mm -hmm. for it because it's way more easier to not change. So all, uh, if, you, if you learn how the connections in your brain work and once those connections are there, th those are the shortcuts. And the shortcuts, of course, creates this habitual behavior. And we don't like to change it because it takes effort, energy, time to, to reconnect various parts of our brains to create different behavior or to create different theories or to create a different identity, yada, yada. So thinking about that and think about what you just said, yes, you have to start with yourself and yourself only. Then become aware probably, but the fact that you too are a human being, you too are programmed, you too uh, don't like change. And 
if you are able to emit that, uh, then that's yeah, a battle. Like how you describe it, it sounds like a battle. Right? Yeah, but but it's it's it sort of is because your um, uh, your subconscious thought patterns and all the um, the connections they are all automatically created, right? So it's not you doing this on purpose. It's like it's it it's it it overcomes you. It's it it just happens, mm -hmm. and you create automatically all those connections that you don't even want to create because they are not helpful. They are not beneficial to your end goal of being happy. So therefore, I was thinking about that, like the inflation part and the financial system part. You actually need some kind of necessity, some kind of red um, light. Oh my God, I need to change. So I fully agree with what you say. You only want to change if you go within and you feel what's up. Because then you feel something that's not making you happy and that's probably the energy you need to change. And I guess the same holds true a little bit for diving deeper into Bitcoin, being more open-minded to study it or to buy it and to transact with it. You do need to be aware of what kind of problem it solves or the necessity we have in the world right now. And therefore, I really believe that if we keep sharing all those insights and information, more and more people coincidentally will be hearing that, listening to that, reading that exactly at the right time. Yes, that's it. Yes, now I get it. And now I see why I have to study it. Prior to this, I did not understand it. And now I do. So I, I guess that's, that's, I feel what my role is going to be um, because I... I also see, and then I'm done, I also see that people don't particularly like it to go within. Like actually meditate or sit still on a chair and be with yourself. Most people mm -hmm. don't like it because it's like the naked truth, right? So also to expect that from people is also probably a long road ahead, I guess. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, what really helped me... Um... It's more like a rational thing to really believe that, you know, short term pain over long term ga gains, you know, that 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 a a everything that gives you resistance, everything that gives you, well, your subconscious a signal uh, to say like, no, no, don't don't do that. <laughs> is actually the thing that you should do. Yeah. Right. And, and it says that because what you mentioned, like nobody wants change. Nobody wants to be confronted with the fact that they well my realization at the bank story, for example, that I lived for, uh, you know, uh, 12, uh, 10, 12 years in an adult life and had no clue what, what I was doing. Yeah, that's not a fun realization, man. Like that's, <laughs> that's no fun, but it is what it is. Right. And, and you can say like, okay, I'm, I'm going to do nothing and I'm going to keep this thought in my head. Like, ah, I'm stupid. I'm unaware. Yada, da. Or I just take, take this loss this experience basically and learn from it and and see how and if i can change it and to do that yes you have to do work that's actual uh yeah <laughs> work it's hard and it's it's an internal battle so for me that rationale that to just keep repeating like you know short-term pain over long-term you know results in long-term gain well said. actually you know like that that uh, that is that is just uh that is just it yeah as like a little tool, you know, to, to sort, to sort keep of going, brain hack, basically. sort of brain hack. Well said. It's like the, 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 sim the simple sentences that you can remind yourself of is definitely how you can hack that habitual subconscious behavior. So that's a really good example, by the way. Yeah. Thanks. So when someone says, what is Bitcoin and why should I care? What is your go-to? <laughs> What's the snippet? What's the pitch? <laughs> Try me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, I would start, and of course it depends on the person, but I would start with something like it's, it's, it's the death of the ego of capital, right? So, um, that's, that's what I like the most about it. Um, it's the decentralized nature and the fact that nobody can control it. Nobody can change it. Nobody can dilute it. Nobody can devalue it. That's what it gives it power. And then of course, because it has a maximum supply that people cannot change. So, because we are inherently corrupt. So we need something that people cannot influence. Well, there you go, Bitcoin. And since inflation is the biggest problem of the current situation in the global financial system, we need something that cannot be inflated. There you go, 
Bitcoin. And because it has a maximum supply and a monetary policy that's fully transparent, everyone, every single person in every business can create their own financial policy based on something really transparent. So you remove all the excuses. It's only you and your business, you and your personal life. And now that whole victim mindset that I hate, by the way. So that's what we can remove from, uh, from lots of people. Like that victim mindset, it's not there anymore. In this world, you actually can create whatever you want to create. In the world of Bitcoin, it's up to you. There's no money printer. There's no central authority that says you don't have access and you do have access. No, create real world value. And that's what I like. I see so many fiat people around me. They make way too much money without delivering any value. And then I see people who do deliver value and they don't make money in various parts of the world. Now you have me questioning what is going on. And therefore, I would say the answer is Bitcoin fixes that. And I really believe it. So that's my, I would say, thing that I would say to someone. This is why you should care. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I love it. I One thought to tie back to what we just talked about. It's like that. It basically forces accountability. Yeah. Right. When I talk to my friend who I want to orange pill about Bitcoin, or well, this is another one I try. <clears throat> They have enough money and I'm trying to like get them in. But he says, okay, if I have a million in Bitcoin, I have to guard it. Like I have to safe keep it, right? And then I say, yeah, that's the whole point. <laughs> but but just, just that, right? That, that accountability is something he has never experienced in his life, right? So that is hard. It's hard to adopt that. And I hear that back in, in what you just said, you know, like you... This will force accountability. You actually have to deliver value to receive value, which I would agree sounds very daunting in, in well, at least the Western world. I think in other parts of the world, yeah, people have no other choice than to be accountable, right? Because it's way harder to find food, for example. So you have to actually do shit you, you yep. don't want to do. Um and my takeaway from that is it, that sounds daunting, but I do think you and I at least both believe, and it would also be daunting for me if I'm really honest, but I do think we both believe the rationale behind this is that that way may, will make you a happier human. Yes. That, that, you know, you will be more proud of doing the work and, and accomplishing or getting rewarded for that and being able to do you know, buy, buy something else or trade that for something else. Like I think, I think people will be more proud and more happy. Although the first, you know, the, the term forced accountability sounds very <laughs> daunting in a yeah, sense. Yeah. And I still believe that if you want to, uh, like keep your money at a bank, um, like by all means do people should, however, be more educated about what happens behind the scenes, but you were talking about fractional reserve banking. So the money isn't there. So do realize there's a risk involved and uh, that risk is real and it's seriously real in other countries of the uh, of the world, right? Less real in, in the Netherlands right now. So I do believe like, okay, so you already know lots of things that were in the news the last decades of people losing their money at the banks. So now you have a solution to that. That means that if it still happens to you, because now you're, if you have listened to this podcast, you're now educated. You now know about the risk at the banks and you know now that Bitcoin is in your own custody and you have to perform full accountability in order to store it safely. So if you then choose to keep it on the bank, even though you're educated, then it's not up to you to complain if this bank goes bankrupt. You're not in the victim mindset anymore. You cannot say, yeah, I had $200,000 or I had a million. Yeah, now it's a choice. Now it's, it's a, a choice. Yes, I agree. it's a choice. So I don't care anymore yeah. if it happens to you because you were educated. I do care if it happens to people who are uneducated. So therefore, I, we educate. However, that victim mindset is gone. You're not allowed to complain about banks if they lose your money, if you had the choice to hold your own money. So uh, it makes life easier. It makes life easier, right? For everyone and anywhere, everywhere around the world. But if you choose to not do it, I understand it as well. And then trust your bank and pay them for it. That's what happens. 
Yeah, I agree. And so it's fine if you do that. Obviously, everyone has a free choice, but you do have to understand. I like what you said about risk. Um, and I want to repeat that as well. Like the money in the bank is not risk free, <laughs> right? It's you loan it to the bank and they will try. That's their business model. They will try to to make more of that when they make more of it that you don't see any upside. Only their shareholders will see the upside. When they lose the money and the bank goes bust, either your money is gone or if it's insured up until a certain amount, you will get the money, you will get the numbers back, but that money will come from the government, which comes from the citizens. So it eventually it comes from you anyway. You know, that is just how it works. There's no judgment in that. Like that is just how it works. But if you understand that there's a very big risk factor that's attached to f following this, that's also why the banks ask you questions if you want to take more than 10K, 20K out of the bank because they can loan out 10 times more. So you basically take away a part of their business model of their cash flow if you take that what you own. I think that's also a very important thing. Like conceptually, this is your property, right? How or why does a third party ask you, what are you going to use this money that you already earned uh, and pay taxes on? Uh, what are you going to use that for? Like, well, how how is that their business, right? And again, like for me, that's another like thing of this system that, that just comes out when you talk about it. That just makes absolutely no sense. But they ask it. Because the system works in a certain way and you have no understanding uh, about the fact that it works like that. So to tie that back into to what you said, if you just follow this uh, system and put your money in the bank and all these things, fine. But make sure that you understand how it works and what the implications are. And if you then still think it's fine, then, you know, fine. <laughs> you know, do that's it. okay. That's totally, do that's it. totally okay. Do it. Do, you know, do like it. Like it's, it, it's super fine. Yeah. yeah. And, and also, of course, I, and I mean, we also have money in the bank because we have to pay for food and, 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 and things. So it did, I, sorry to add one thing. Like, I don't think this is like an anti-bank thing or no. whatever, you know, the bank is just a part of how the system works. And of course we use it and we all have bank accounts. So it's not anti-bank or whatever. This is anti, you know, anti-bad money. <laughs> Yes, yes. Uh, and that, that's what it's about. Yeah, and I want to add, the thing that I want to add is, yes, it's anti-money. It's not anti-bank at all because they provide services that people love, like, and use. Yes. Which is fine. I agree. I do believe that... Uh, and uh, needed, by the way, and how needed. they started. Yes, and needed. for uh, companies yes, and all these things. Yes, and by the way, like the... Um, you, um, the education part here is also to understand that if you do a little bit of history lessons, and I did a lot of those, uh, regarding to money, it's, um, we are in fact in the end of a long-term debt cycle. And that's important to realize. And it's not only the end of a long-term debt cycle, um, the last, like the last long-term debt cycle, like 80 to 100 years or so. It's like, if you look further down back in time, you also see that every time when we blew stuff up, banks run into trouble the first, okay? So the risk that normally is the risk that the bank takes by lending out your money to someone else to help people invest, uh, to lend out, to buy a house. And if those these persons or these people cannot return the money, then you that's the risk that you don't get your money back. Those risks are small when we are in good times, right? Now, so now we turn into less good times. But importantly, more importantly, I would say the long term debt cycle is really getting to an end. And if you then see what happened in history, like for thousands of years, you saw actually that we returned back to hard forms of money. So people lose trust day by day, year by year, decade by decade in that paper money part. And in that end cycle, you do see that banks run into trouble first. So take that with you in the educational part. It's not only the risk that they always have the banks, you could argue that they now have higher risks because people have less faith in money if there's more inflations globally. So that means that you especially should be aware right now and not keep all the money in one bank account probably. Yes, because the most insurance is only uh, one account on one bank. So yes. if you have more than certain amount, uh, like more money than what the insurance covers, you need more more bank accounts. 
Um, yeah, I, f- I fully agree with what you say, and especially in this time, um, you know, there have been like some uh, publications or news, uh, like uh, um, n- news messages about you know uh, a bank run at this uh, day and age, you know, could be way worse because it's all digitally, et cetera, et cetera, right? There's not going to be a line at the bank for people who want the cash. C- currently, <laughs> that that would probably not even be possible because the cash is not in a bank, which is also just interesting to, uh, yeah, to learn. Interesting. But, uh, but um, I, I wonder what will happen if, if, if more and more people realize that, uh, yeah, perhaps the money is not as safe as they fought in a bank and they want to move it to whatever, whether it's Bitcoin or whatever, you know, the, 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 let's call it the system is going to have a real problem because if they are going to say, well, you cannot take your money out, right? Like now how they are asking questions when you take out 10, 10 K or more, uh, then more and more people will think like, Hey, (laughs) this doesn't sound right. You know, like how, how does this actually work? So yeah, I'm, I'm, I don't want to say excited, but I'm intrigued by by what is going to come because, uh, yeah, what you mentioned about debt cycle in America, like obviously we don't live in America, but uh, America, at, at least the money is everywhere. So we are definitely also downstream from any uh, anything that, uh, that, that could possibly blow up in America. And um, yeah, that's why I think, and maybe this is a nice one to end it with. That's that's why people say Bitcoin is a life raft, right? Like it's a lifeboat. It's it's at least something outside of a current system that could potentially, again, right, no investment advice, etc., uh, help you protect yourself from yeah. a, a flawed system that we currently use. Definitely, as a release, a release valve. To me, it's a release valve. It's going to suck up value where the older system is slowly dying, the new system will suck value. And of course that goes up and down until the the old system dies faster. So I agree with that. And I also believe the last thing, I think that the dollar, even though it will probably blow up in the States as well, I guess that the dollar will suck up more value than the Euro. So in that case, um, even if it blows up over there, I, I worry about what happens in Europe as well. I don't think that the mm-hmm. euro will survive um, or has better chances to survive than the dollar. So in that sense, uh, I think there's a lot a, a lot to say about that as well, uh, but maybe for another time. But please do realize that if it blows up in the States, Europe is not better off at all. No, I agree. All okay, right. Very last question. And I ask everyone, what's a core belief that you will never let go? A core belief that I will never let go. <laughs> um, well, that's probably something that's a hot topic right now as well. That um, biologically, we only have a man and a woman. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, let's see how far we get with this podcast now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, man. Thanks so much. I loved, I loved this conversation. Uh, I think, um, yeah, very different than what I thought up front, but I really like this uh, philosophical and spiritual angle as I also do really see that as part of, of the Bitcoin journey. So thanks a lot. And um, yeah, like, could you share where people can find you, follow you? Um, yeah to yeah. hear more from you. Yeah, I'm always on, on LinkedIn. So my name, of course, Mark with a C von Versendal. And I'm on Twitter as well. Uh, so you will find me at the same name probably. So please follow me there. Uh, I have a company, CryptoUnseen.com, CryptoUnseen.com, of course, created to share people what crypto is in fact all about instead of all the scam stories that most her- have heard about. And in that community, we, of course, share all the macroeconomic and geopolitical insights and, of course, the philosophical insights that we discussed today. So if you're interested in connecting with me, you can find me in those places. Awesome, man. And Bram, thank you very uh, well. You did a great job. See you soon. (laughs) Yes, and we see each other soon. Thank you very much. Cheers, man. Bye. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, it would be amazing if you could rate, review, and subscribe on the podcast platform of your choice. It will help us educate more millennials on the importance of Bitcoin. 
You can follow and connect with me on Twitter. I'm Bramke, that's at B-R-A-M-K. And if you are or know someone who has an interesting perspective on Bitcoin that's worth sharing, hit me up. I read and reply to every single message. I appreciate your support and hope you'll be here for the next episode. Thanks for listening. Bye.